realize I was running it. That's fine. Uh, that's what she said. Okay. Congratulations. There you go. <laughs> We're live. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will start this study session of our SIPSA, uh, elementary SIPSA this evening. Thank you, principals, for being here. And um, we probably, will we start with a Pledge of Allegiance? Please stand. I'll go ahead. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And I understand that uh, Ms. Bierman will be heading things up. Yes, good evening, Trustee Pisano and members of the board. Uh, we are here this evening to hear the presentations for four of our schools, our elementary schools. They are going to tell us a little bit about their focus areas for this school year. And then we are going to start with Elliott Elementary School, Maricela Rivera. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, board members and my fellow colleagues. Um, let me share my screen. Let me see if I could get it. Oops. Yeah. Can everybody see this? Yes. yes. We're good. Thank you. Well, um, like I said, good evening. Uh, my name is Maricela Rivera, and I'm the proud principal of Elliott School. So I wanted to start off with um, just going over our mission statement and how Elliott Elementary School is really dedicated um, to provide the best opportunity for all of our Elliott students and families. Um, because ultimately our goal is um, to, to create these lifetime, lifetime um, long learners and productive members of society. They will be our next um, future of Gilroy and we're doing the best that we can and giving them the best opportunity um, so that they can become um, these members and we will see them in the future here. I'm, as you all know, last year and the last year and, and, and a half was very challenging year for um, all of everywhere. Um, but I'm going to see, say that it was especially challenging to Elliott School. Um, the closures really presented so many of um, issues that we had and I'm just going to talk a little bit about them. One of the biggest challenges that we had was attendance. If we look at the table at the bottom, some of these, there is there were 484 students that we had. And out of those 484 students, we had 162 students with um, multiple absence or missed classes. And if you look at the percentage, 33.47%, um, that was almost equivalent to um, students missing one class a week or even um, one session a week. So we really had issues with attendance, um, especially at the beginning of the school year. Um, we had connectivity issues. We did pass out so many hotspots, but as you know, many of our families here live in apartment complexes. Some of these apartments, I'm not sure if they have like firewalls or something where some of the connection couldn't get through. And so that was an issue here. We had lots of language barriers. Um, not only was it a different language, but it's that language of technology. And that probably was one of our biggest challenges with many of our families because some of these families couldn't help their own children. How do I do this? How do I upload assignments on Google Classroom? 
my son is always doing the work. How come I can't get um, the teacher keeps letting me know that he's not turning anything in. So there were a lot of um, these barriers with the language and not only the language that we speak, but that technology was huge. Um, another uh, challenge was the support at home. As you know, many of our Elliott families are working families um, and most of the time, both parents were working, the students were at home, they were on their own or they were with older siblings um, or even by themselves. Um, and one of the other challenges was that was very important was the quiet workspace. I would get so many emails from teachers to please speak to some families about these quiet workspaces. Well, I would speak to these families, but many of them um, didn't have a big space to uh, move around in. They had maybe a little kitchen and a living room, but there were other people living there. They had one bedroom and they would try to put, sometimes they had three or four kids in there. So it was very challenging because I did speak to many um, families. But despite the many challenges, we do have to celebrate some of our wins. And some of these wins were these um, home visits that we did. Um, the community liaison, my attendance clerk, myself, we began with um, visiting some of these homes and finding out why our students were not, were not on. Or we would you know, ask parents like, how could we do this? So we would help them right then and there. Um, and our attendance did improve. So I'm going to say that our attendance was probably about an 80% at the beginning of the school year, like 81, 82. And it did steady off in the middle of the school year with about 91, 92%. So we did improve our attendance. Um, we did have technology support at school as well. So um, many of our families that were struggling, I don't know Google Classroom, I don't know Epic, I don't know how to get these books. The teacher supposed, is saying that this child is supposed to do this. Well, we would, um, we would see them here at school. We would go outside, we would support them with this technology and help them through this. Uh, we continued communication with families. We were making lots of calls. The office was making calls. I was making calls and this really helped um, with a lot of the families. Sometimes teachers would say, oh, the student is not here again or he doesn't wanna turn on his camera. And then there I was on the phone, like, can you please have him turn on his camera? And the, sometimes the families didn't know. Um, because they weren't sitting there. They always had something to do. I, I spoke to some moms that were struggling with that. Um, as soon as they would leave, the kids would turn off the camera or turn off their mic. So, um, but with the continued communication, it really helped. Um, we did offer parent classes through, through Zoom last year, um, really to help these students through the, the families through the pandemic and how to help their child um, with some of this technology and with um, doing some of the work at home. So those are, we will take all the ways that we can get. And now moving forward, um, we're happy to be back in school and we have really great plans for this, um, this school year. So in line with our LCAP goals, I'm gonna go over some of the action plans that Elliot has this year um, to, uh, help and improve of all the learning loss that has happened. So we will monitor and support the implementation of those effective and focused classroom instruction. Like what does it look like and what are we doing? How are we using the curriculum to make it meaningful for every student? Um, I am providing professional development refreshers at staff meetings for implementation of those high leverage strategies um, and we're using Steel and Glad strategies, but these are strategies that really focus on what, do, what we want the students to do, how they are speaking, how are they collaborating together and what they're doing. Um, we are also using iReady at Elliott to support instruction. Um, this program is used in ELA and math and we can really monitor growth. Um, it also helps students work at their level and it increases as they learn. Um, I am very happy to announce that this year, um, I and a team here at Elliott, team of teachers, are working on creating a STEAM room here. And this is really to bring in some of that 
science, bring in some of those next generation science standards, but it's also bringing in technology and engineering and exposing these students to a lot of this. So I'm very excited and I will keep everybody updated on how that goes. Um, we are going to hold a college and career week um, to introduce and motivate students to seek higher education. Um, so I'm excited to see that through this year as well. In line with our LCAP goal too, to provide equitable support, one of the biggest focuses this year for Elliott is we are using the MTSS um, really umbrella model um, to provide those tier one and tier two interventions for these students and we know they need them. Um, this will mean that um, we are utilizing all the staff members that we have here that are available to provide that focus support for these students in literacy. We have our literacy facilitators and our coaches, paraeducators, we have some CalSOP tutors, and we have some retired intervention teachers that are also working here as well. Um, in line with this, we will continue our data cycles to really track these students and see how their progress is going. So we're really gonna monitor them, um, look at pre and post assessments and look at it together on how we can improve um, we will continue with the integrated and designated ELD, which is very important, especially during this time with some of these students who have not been in school. So we're gonna model a lot of that language for them. And again, we are using iReady, but iReady will also use to, sub, to be a supplement and um, provide that targeted support in, for students as well. For our LCAP goal three for school culture and engagement, we are using the new school-wide um, second step. And I know that um, all the other schools are doing it as well. We're really focusing on that social emotional health. Um, we're, I'm providing time during staff meetings to really talk about it, how it's going, and really look at some of the goals of the SEL program. Um, we are going to continue to improve our truancy meetings, and, um, and this will also bring in our PBIS, which is crucial this year. This positive behavior intervention that we're doing will continue it. We know that the students this year have not been in school for about a year and a half, and so um, this PBIS is really along with our character counts. Um, is very important to help students remember again um, and focus on those uh, positive behaviors that we wanna see in school. Um, we are very lucky to be working alongside Santa Clara County Office of Ed, and we will have a wellness center here um, on site to provide some of that um, social emotional support as well. Um, they will be working with families as well and students to help them regulate um, some of their emotions. Um, we will continue with parent engagement as allowed and as best we can during this time. Um, I'm also happy to say that we uh, have a partnership with the juvenile probation department um, through the neighborhood safety services unit where um, we are given some help to to provide some of these post-social activities for students, uh, maybe doing some art, maybe some sports. Um, we're just trying to bring other things to these students and more opportunities for them. Before I'm done, I just wanna um, let everybody know that we um, received the Platinum Award for our PBIS implementation again this year. I know we received it last year, so I'm very happy with um, how we're working with PBIS and how the students are getting some of this positive behavior. Um, and ultimately, um, I just want to let you know that Elliott is such an extraordinary school um, with some amazing and caring staff, some students who are great, and I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for listening to this presentation. Thank you, Principal Rivera. Appreciate it. Are there any um, board comments or questions? I have a couple Michelle? of questions or comments. Sure, Michelle. Um, 
uh, do you have the an actual librarian or is that a library clerk? I'm, I'm looking at page 18. She's a library clerk. Okay. Yes. Li sorry, library clerk. Okay, I just wanted to, to check. Um, are you using any other kind of staff? Like um, one school is using ER duty people, you know, in their down downtime. I was wondering, are has that been tried at your school with you? We have not. We have not tried that right now. Um, I need these yard supervisors at every time. I mean, right now it's not really a downtime because they're doing certain like four hours a day, um, but that would be good. But we are utilizing every help that I can get. So any, I have some wonderful um, intervention uh, teachers who want, who work here and like to be here. And so um, mm -hmm. anybody that can help I'm, we're using for the yard supervisors right now. Okay, because, you know, in the past, Elliot used everybody. Yeah. But I won't go there too much in detail. Um, so what exactly are you doing to increase parental involvement over and above what you've already done in the past? Well, we, um, I'm going to have some parent workshops this year, especially this year as we come back from um, where we were at in the situation with COVID-19. So I'm hoping to bring a lot of parents in through that, that way to help them help their child. So we're gonna do like lots of make and take workshops. Um, we're hoping to, um, right now it's very difficult unless I do it um, completely after school, then I can bring some parents in and have them here. But that's the way we're going to do it. And I'm hoping to start with certain grade levels at first, especially the little ones, the TK and the K that are starting off. Um, but that's one of the ways that we are going to bring a lot of parents in, just workshops. Um, I know that a lot of parents have come in and it's like, how can I help my child? So doing some of these will help, I'm hoping. Okay, I know you had uh, increased, you had some Zoom trainings and meetings. Do you think that helps once once they get used to using Zoom? Does that increase parent participation? Um, you know, with with our community, it's a it's a little bit difficult. They don't have devices at home that um, support some of the Zoom because we have tried it. We tried it last year, um, and it was very difficult. The one thing that they did have were or Chromebooks, and that's how I got a lot of parents at my meetings last year because they had student Chromebooks, but now they don't have them this year. And so um, some of the, the parents would, would use their phone, but sometimes their internet wasn't very good, their Wi-Fi isn't good. And so um, I'm, I'm concerned about that. So I'm going to try and do as many things as I can safely after school with some of these parents here, especially at Elliott. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other um, board comments or questions? Okay, thank you, Principal Rivera. Appreciate it. Thank you. And our next presenter it is Maritza Salcido from Rod Kelly School. You're, Marisa, you're muted. Okay, uh, do you see the presentation? Yes, okay, perfect. Yes. Uh, good evening, Trustee Placeno and board members um, and uh, cabinet district official. Um, I'm really excited to present our SIPSA plan and our plan for the year and talk about last year, um, Rod Kelly Elementary. So every year we have a theme. And for our distance learning theme, um, this, is, this is my sixth year here, so it's my sixth theme this year. Um, it was learning together even while we're apart. And I tried to end up aprendiendo juntos aunque estamos separados. We do everything in Spanish and English, um, not only because we are a dual immersion school, but because our population, uh, this, the highest second language is Spanish. And so this was a message I put out on a lot of my parent square messages. Um, we started our staff meetings with this because it, there were some challenges um, being apart and still trying to come together as a community. 
Um, this year, our theme is Launch into Learning, Lanzar al Aprendizaje. We are still building the rocket right now. We are nowhere near launching. Um, probably in November, we're going to get ready to launch and have a big kickoff assembly. Right now, we are definitely in the building phases. So we did have quite a few challenges because of um, COVID and the school shutdowns. And one thing I do always want to credit is how amazing um, the shift was from public education being in person to this online platform. Um, I was really scared. There were nights that I was just so worried about this being the end of public education. I truly believe in public education. I'm a product of public education, as are my children. And um, I just felt that maybe we wouldn't do it. And for the teachers to be able to shift to a completely online platform in such a short amount of time and do the job that they did was amazing. That being said, there are some challenges that were posed. Um, parent outreach and support was very challenging, um, not only because of personal issues that were going on because of COVID, job loss, uh, all this, these shutdowns, um, but also just the platform. I, we started in the spring when we first shut down with WebEx, then we switched to Zoom. All of those things kind of really uh, hindered us reaching parents. Um, School closures also impacted some students more than others, creating inequities and in learning opportunities during distance learning. The achievement gaps became greater um, during this time. Students that came from homes where they have access to technology, where the parents knew technology, um, really did a lot better during distance learning. Also the language barrier, as Mrs. Rivera mentioned, that was a huge deal. Um, and so we really saw that and we, we are dealing with the after effects of it now. Um, technology, just the use of technology. My staff in the front office became IT support. And as did the teachers and everyone else, our learning curve was huge. And so just the use of technology. One thing I do have to say, Rod Kelly was one-to-one -one with Chromebooks prior to the shutdown. And so our kinders had experience on Chromebooks and it made it a lot easier. That being said, it was still a huge challenge for us. We had we were meeting people outside and um, trying to help them access the classes. Um, everybody's learning curve improved, but the beginning of the year, these were huge, huge. Um, they really just impeded the students being able to access to, uh, instruction. Attendance and engagement, our parent club was almost non-existent, as was our ELAC. I've always had a very healthy ELAC um, group. And this year it was a huge challenge to get meetings together and to have attendance uh, during, this was during the shutdown. Um, providing materials to students needed for instruction. Uh, we had monthly pickup. Um, even then we'd have about maybe 40 to 50 kids that wouldn't pick it up or pick it up late. So the instruction that the materials were not given to them timely. Um, we tried everything. We delivered materials. <laughs> we had times where we'd leave them outside and parents could pick them up whenever they wanted to, whenever they needed to. And so that was a huge challenge, um, having get the hand, giving the students tools in their hands to be able to access all of their learning. Um, and then creating new systems, routines, and expectations when we reopen schools. It, this was all new. And the things that we had to consider, it was just an overwhelming task. And so um, we, I feel like our team as an elementary team, we all did a really great job as did the teachers adjusting and modifying whatever they needed to modify. Um, but the scrutiny we were put under because of COVID and the dangers that were around and the lack of information that sometimes was out there or, or the misinformation, it was a huge challenge. And I, I feel like we navigated through that well, but with a lot of hiccups and a lot of extra hours. Um, developing learning plans that account for learning loss while keeping instruction standards based. So even upon reopening, we had students that were in person and then still online and trying to deliver standards based instruction during that time was very challenging um, and to account for the students that hadn't been um, present in the classes at all. And also providing collaboration time for teachers. Um, that's more of a current challenge. Um, I feel that the Wednesdays that we were given through um, the reopening were great to have that Wednesday PD time. Um, and that, account, that really took care of some of those needs. 
So I did mine a little different. I highlighted successes from last year and my next steps. And so for my LCAP goal one, um, one of my huge successes uh, was Distance Learning Advisory Committee. Um, they were key in developing focus areas during distance learning and reopening. Not ever having been a virtual teacher, I was kind of flying blind. And I really pride myself in the experience that I have and that lens that I bring to um, my job. And so when I would have an idea like, oh, we need to really look at this data. And then I'd meet with my distance learning and advisory committee and they would almost laugh and say, Ms. Alcido, I don't think that's the right way to go. You know, let's really consider focusing on this. And so we really had some great open conversations and some just real talk on how I can support the school. And without that distance learning advisory committee, I think I would have had more missteps than I had because it wasn't a smooth, perfect transition, but they really did support me. Um, software programs provide an opportunity to monitor growth and differentiate instruction. One program that I was really impressed with, over several, but um, Seesaw was one, Screencastify, where the students would record presentations or themselves reading. And that's when we knew where they were really at. A lot of times we couldn't tell how much support parents gave or older brothers or sisters, but with certain software programs that we had, the teachers were able to listen to the kids read as if they were in person and truly see what was happening with their learning. Um, small group instruction for ELA and math was a success for the students that attended. Um, it, attendance was an issue, so when they didn't attend, they didn't get that time, but that was something that the teachers valued. And in our reopening, we had 62% of our students return. We had 445 students return. And it was beautiful to hear laughter and see children on campus again, and to see that the parents really trusted us to let their students return. Um, grade level collaboration and Wednesday TV time, I can mention that, that was a huge success. Um, now for my next steps. Um, establish the focus of the academic lead team. I do meet with them sometimes twice a month. Um, and one of the big things that we're going to push this year that's new is micro-focused PLCs. We're going to target certain students and see their growth. And we have talked about this. The challenge with that is, of course, that collaboration time and the lack of subs. Um, implement a more focused approach for computer software and resources based on student need. I don't want just open access to these computer programs. Just you need 30 minutes of this. It needs to be purposeful. And so we've been talking about what the re what um, requirements we should have or what time uh, the students, how much time they should be spending and for what specific skills. Where are we going to see the growth in the use of these programs? Also uh, provide PD or training around programs that will support students' progress. We have GLAD, Whole Brain Teaching, Letters. Second step is our SEL program. Um, there are many things that the district is offering as well as uh, at Rod Kelly. And so I think that we just need to keep providing opportunities for these teachers to learn as we um, transition to this uh, full instructional year. Um, and then have a display in every classroom by October. And yay, they were delivered uh, two days ago. So I am one-to-one -one on displays uh, for my school. We have, um, this was a three-year plan. I started three years ago outfitting the school and this was the third year and I have um, completed the displays for every classroom. Um, help guide staff with realistic goals and monthly focuses. I feel like I had to pull them back a little in the beginning of the year and let them know that this year was a little different. And so August was really just social skills, structure, building that classroom um, environment. And September was getting the kids to do high success, low rigor skills. Uh, uh, activities because we needed to build their confidence. And now this month in October, we're really starting to work in that small group instruction and leveled groups with specific um, goals and focuses to see that growth. And for my LCAP, oh, I skipped one over one, didn't I? There's a little lag, sorry. Um, LCAP goal to provide equitable support for all learners. I think some successes that we had last year, we provided targeted support for students during distance learning and small group instruction. We actually had intervention. My literacy facilitator uh, held some intervention groups that were highly successful for the students that attended. Um, purchased online resources and programs to support differentiated 
differentiation, enrichment, and progress monitoring. Um, I feel like the programs that we had and that we used were really good at providing us with more information as to where the students needed support. Um, implementation of school-wide rules, procedures, and expectations. We had Zoom rules, Rod Kelly Zoom rules, like we normally do with the, just the behavior expectation. All teachers use the same presentation. And that really gives us that community feel and the teachers know how to um, provide the expectations to the students. And no matter what grade they were in, the expectations were the same. Um, fourth and fifth grade teachers were trained in GLAD strategies. Um, we really did miss the in-person um, models, but I think the strategies that were taught will be very useful. And teachers used iStation data to identify targeted students and support their learning. Um, I feel like the, because we had those Wednesdays, they were able to look at the reports, target students, and also look for growth. Our next steps for goal two is use the baseline assessment data to identify students with greatest need and provide support currently, and I'll move into what we're doing currently, and provide training for teachers to support them in delivering instructional needs based on current academic levels. We have students, you know, I showed that triangle where you usually have about 70% of your class at level, then maybe, you know, tier two interventions, about 20, 25%, and then 5% for the tier three interventions. That triangle is really not um, applicable to the classroom makeup that we currently have. Um, we have more like 60% students at least a grade level below. And so teachers that were used to teaching out of just straight those fourth grade standards or third grade standards, we really had to, I gave, I, I provided the continuum for the teachers of the standards and said, we need to find where our students are at and work with them there. During small group instruction, of course, our whole class is that standards-based instruction. We are still using standards-based instruction, but it may be a lower grade standard within that strand. We need to meet the kids where they're at. I hate to look at this as a deficiency model, just let's meet them where they're at and bring them up. It's, it's just a, a year that we're really looking for progress. We have implemented a tiered multi-pronged intervention program utilizing Kelsoap tutors, our literacy facilitator, assessment para, and in-class small group instruction. Um, we have currently four Kelsoap tutors that are using Fontes and Pinnell intervention kits that have proven to be very successful. They were used this summer and they are working right now with 23 students. Um, and my literacy facilitators, they're focusing on second and third. My literacy facilitators focusing on fourth and fifth. Um, these groups are not stagnant. We will have intervention cycles and we will be cycling through kids as needed with um, a lot of assessment for growth and monitoring. We also established a, whole, a voluntary whole brain teaching lead team. That is going really well. Um, I have three meetings with my staff where they get some instruction on whole brain teaching. And then the other meetings are open to, we actually opened up to open them up to the district and we get a, an average of 15 to 20 teachers participating. And the strategies that he's, uh, that he's kind of shifted more to a very, an academic goal uh, oriented program where it's about speaking paragraphs, which is really cool about answering not only with one sentence complete answers, but adding two or three sentences. So the goal is just not only about behavior and classroom management, but also academics. And uh, I feel that Rod Kelly was definitely ready for that next step. Goal three, um, success is a student council met monthly and planned spirit days and drives. Our spirit days were pretty fun. Um, even though we were virtual, the kids at Rod Kelly have wonderful spirit. Um, and I hate, well, I love spirit days, but not when I have to go to the bank on those days because I get the weirdest looks. Uh, but student recognition and reward systems and distance learning and in-person instruction were impactful. We still kept our notable nights going and I had very high attendance to those meetings. And if the parents missed it, I always got an email, Ms. Salcido, when can we do the Zoom meeting for the presentation of the certificate? So they were very meaningful to these kids. We also did some contests over uh, breaks of the, who did the most Lexia or iStation minutes. And the kids would win a little certificate and maybe a card to Baskin Robbins, Target or McDonald's, Parent Club provided those. And minutes were way up during vacations whenever we gave out those incentives. Um, School-wide expectations, routines, and rules, like I said, upon reopening, 
we had we changed all of our um, presentations so there were kids with masks and distanced um, and the kids did a really good job we would always say like you know you put zombie arms sometimes they do little dinosaur arms but we worked with them and tried to make it fun um, I also did a lunch or breakfast with the principal. I love being out at recess. I love going out and interacting with my students. And I couldn't really do that. And when I'd go into the classrooms, I was muted. Kinders didn't know who I was at all. So I would have a week of lunch with the principal or breakfast with the principal. And I'd have two grade levels at a time. And the attendance was pretty high. I usually had about 20 to 30 kids. And we'd eat breakfast together. Sometimes I'd cook while I was online with them. Um, it wasn't a reward. It was just for anybody who wanted to pop in. And, and that was just a way for me to get to know the kids in the way that I do in when we're in person um, without having any academic um, uh, pressure on them. Um, all students were provided with supplies and resources needed to succeed. And I really... Um, appreciated that. And it's something that sets everybody on that level playing field. Um, in the classroom, we're able to provide students with everything. And during distance learning, we were able to provide kids with what they needed. Some teachers, you know, wanted to, us to send home dice. So we sent home dice. Potting soil for a science experiment with a cup, we sent that home. Whatever they needed to make these kids' experiences as close to as what they would have in the classroom, we um, and thankfully, we had the money to do it. Um, next steps for goal three, school-wide impl implementation of the second step program. Um, that program is going very well. The discussions are deep and rich. Um, kids have been learning about focus, the difference between assertiveness, aggressiveness, and being a passive listener. And um, it has everybody using this common vocabulary, which is wonderful. Um, implementation of whole brain teaching roles and specific classroom strat strategies that is going very well. There's a, not only the scoreboard now, but this reward system called Stories that um, the majority of my teachers are using. I would like this year to also provide more opportunities for parent involvement. I have done kinder workshops in the past. I almost, um, for my ELAC and my parent club, I've done how to do a successful conference. I want to do one just open up to the community, to the whole school community, and just have a night before a parent conference when we can talk about what the expectation should be. Um, and that would be in person because like Maria, Ms. Rivera said, a lot of our, our uh, families don't have Chromebooks. So they had access to their on the online because we had issued Chromebooks to the students. Um, and then also incentivizing parent involvement. We have a lot of Rod Kelly t-shirts and things that Parent Club have uh, donated to the school that they've said use these as incentives. Um, and maybe uh, that's something that I need to look into to increase parent involvement. Um, focus on increased daily attendance. That's always something we focus on. A lot of outreach. Right now, there are still people that are struggling with uh, the after effects of COVID. You know, the pandemic isn't really over for a lot of people. And so um, it's dealing with everybody with open communication and with sensitivity and a heart, really. Um, and sorry. Oh. Um, these are just some pictures that represent Rod Kelly. Uh, I really love my school. Um, I, my, the teachers are amazing. The first day of school, I've always gone around and taken pictures. That poster in the center is the first day of school with my teachers. Um, some were teaching in the classroom, some were online. And so I tried to keep things the same. Um, you can see Miss Pretty and I on twin day, character dress up day, our new playground. We have music, the star, starring art. Um, there is one of my notable nights when they came back in person. Um, it, it's been a very challenging experience, but a very rewarding experience when I see the kids at school. And I'm at, I believe, 731 students right now. Um, and it's wonderful to have the school back to its capacity. That's it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Principal Salcido. Are there any questions or comments from uh, board members? Well, I have one question. Mm -hmm. And um, how you were talking about, uh, I like your idea about how to have a successful conference, parent conference, by the way. And what other kinds of ideas uh, do you have for increasing parent involvement? 
Um, I would like to do like foundational skills, literacy. If your students aren't readers, how do you expose them to reading? Mm -hmm. um, that's one that we're working on. Um, my literacy facilitator is working on that for parents. And also um, one challenge that I didn't mention is our fifth grade teachers are not used to teaching foundational skills. And so that's something that we're also working on some PD for teachers, but I think we can uh, adapt it for parents and really have um, some success there. Okay, good. Well, uh, thank you. Ms. Pucena? Yes. I have a, is that 62% students that return, is that, is that accurate? So is a student, that would mean 272 did not return and they're doing virtual learning and from what I think, from what I understand, there are only a, only two hundred plus virtual learning uh, academy oh, students in, in the, the district. Spring. That was in in, in the spring. Opened. Oh, okay. Not okay. now. Everyone is back now. That was in the spring. <laughs> okay, that was my my concern. Okay, Thanks thank for you. I just, that because people yeah. watching might be confused. So that was yeah. in the spring. Yeah. Okay, and uh, the other thing I want, I know that, in th and this applies to all principals and it even applied to the, to the high school presentation that we got it, but I know that we can be our biggest critic. Uh, you guys are thriving. You guys are doing amazing. The fact that you guys are, uh, have, are on this end kind of more than halfway through a pandemic that nobody ever predicted. Um, <laughs> you guys are, and, and brought along your staff, your students, your community, your parents. You guys are doing amazing. You guys are doing amazing. You guys are doing fantastic. I, I want to kind of let you guys know if, uh, that the fact that we haven't heard any big issues, you guys are, are doing good. And I want to commend you guys for that. And I'm definitely not trying to be flippant or anything like that, but you guys need to be commended for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Diaz. I agree. Okay. Ms. Beerman, next. Yes, so our next presenter is Jean Wells Southland with uh, Rutgers School. Hi, good evening, trustees, Superintendent Flores, Cabinet, and my amazing colleagues. Thank you for letting us be here this evening to share our challenges and our successes and plans. Let me just share my screen. Everyone see my screen? No. Don't see it. There we go. Okay. If you're seeing your faces again, I've shared the wrong screen. <laughs> we see it. Perfect. All right. Um, I'm going to just start just to highlight a couple things from our mission, and it really is to meet the diverse needs of our students at Rucker. Um, and to do it in a culturally responsive way. And if you've been with us at a morning pledge, you know that you always need to be safe, courteous, and do your personal best. I think we're all striving to do our personal best as we enter this new school year. You've heard this evening a lot of the challenges. A lot of our challenges are similar, um, particularly for access for students at Rucker. Um, I really wanna highlight the successes because without the support of my colleagues and all of you, um, this would have been an even more challenging school year um, and last school year. It feels like it's just one continuation. Um, but Rucker, I think, often was thought of as the gate school. And so, you know, those were only 60 or 70 students that were of our whole school population. And we had 500 plus other students that I think that we didn't really get to know well until this pandemic helped, you know, hit. And I, it's not that we didn't care about those students and we didn't know them, but really some of the unique challenges that our families at Rucker face didn't come to light until that March 13th when we closed schools a year and a half ago. Um, and so with the effort of everyone involved in the district, we were able to do some amazing things. Um, really the first things is to understand who the Rucker community is, that a lot of our families are very rural. They live in non-standard housing. So while other schools, you know, have connectivity issues because of, you know, locations and apartments, ours had connectivity issues because they live in a rural environment where the infrastructure does not support a really robust um, access to technology. 
in addition to the language barriers of families. Um, and I love how Ms. Rivera put it, not only the native language, but the, the technology language, right? Our families don't have that level of access. But because of those challenges, we have a really deep understanding of who the Rucker community and our, and our families are. With the help of the district, we fed so many families. So I put pictures so you can see the faces, our, our nutrition staff every day and every weekend packed you know, bags of food, fed our kids. Um, everyone jumped out of sort of their line of work. My assessment pair became, you know, an extension of the IT support, providing IT support for families, how they log on. Um, we had families you know, come by and pick up material distribution. So really flipped our school system as we've discussed kind of on, on edge um, and created different ways to access our learning. Um, we were one of the first schools to open as a access center. And that was a huge accomplishment, not just for us, but really for the district to take the need of our families and really quickly have a solution to get kids online and learning. So I just want to highlight like it's, you know, Rucker is an amazing place, but there's really sort of that combination of everyone's efforts of really what made um, some of the biggest challenges um, bearable last year. As we went into this school year, we're really celebrating the return to in-person learning. It's given us opportunities to reconnect with our kids in really positive ways. Our teachers could connect and collaborate We've really missed being with each other. So now that we can be present, we can you know, have meetings together, staff meetings, and really welcome our students back. So that's sort of the theme of our year is really that celebration of the return to in-person learning, which seems like a weird, you know, two years ago, we would never would have distinguished between distance and in-person learning, but we're glad, glad to be back. So I wanna highlight a few um, of our goals and actions for goal one, which is the high quality instruction. Um, I attended a great training with Kathleen and probably some of my colleagues. So I'm gonna ask all of you to indulge in this little activity. So one of the things is I want everyone to cross their arms. So it feels very comfortable. As I started my school year, I told my staff to cross your arms in the opposite arm. So it feels some, you know, like they're your arms, but it feels a little uncomfortable. And so I really premise that we are going to feel a little uncomfortable as we start this school year because we're going to have to change the way we approach our students' learning and instruction, right? And also to be mindful that we don't fall back into that comfortable way of instructing because our students definitely had different needs. And we found that they had different needs in distance learning. So when we look at our successes of last year, I feel like we did a really good job of providing a quality distance learning instruction program. You know, was it perfect? No. Could we do it better? Hopefully we'll never have to have the opportunity to do that. Um, but because we had talked about those Wednesday professional development time, you know, we collaborated as an elementary principal team. We worked with Kathleen and coaches and every Wednesday we were really able to develop some high quality professional development to our teachers that helped them become better at being a distance learning teacher. So that was a huge success. Um, we also provided interactive displays in our classrooms when, when kids, uh, once teachers and kids came back. So for us moving our classrooms into a more modern era of instruction, so just that continuation of best practices in the virtual, bringing some of those tools into the classroom when we return in the spring was a success for us. Um, like some of the other schools, we did establish a site-based distance learning advisory committee. Uh, we met every other week. Um, I had a representative from each grade level and we talked about what was happening and how they were planning and how to better uh, reach and keep students in a virtual way. As I'm looking forward into the school year, we're already almost a whole trimester in, um, I've established a literacy committee to support effective instruction. So I have, again, a representative from each grade level because we are really focused on that small group reading instruction. Um, much like the other schools, 60 to 70% of our students are not where we would like them to be um, on their baseline assessment. So that gap has become pretty large and it's predominantly affecting our, our English learners. So that's something that we really need to target um, very directly. Um, 
And through that, um, more than half of my teachers have signed up for the letters training. So my staff has a huge commitment to that literacy development and, and supporting the needs of our students on our campus. We're also increasing the professional development within our staff meetings. So every staff meeting, um, I'm providing a glad strategy or I'm providing an instructional strategy. So really kind of taking on that instructional leader role with my team to make sure we're not just, you know, planning the next school event, but we're really targeting and using that time to talk about instruction. Um, and really the last piece of my, our goal in this is re-engaging our students in learning. Um, stamina in the classroom. Uh, kids are like, you know, most of the kids that I talk to are like, oh, so hard, you know, such a long day. We have so much work to do. So helping rebuild that stamina with our students and, you know, supporting the importance of learning um, has been a focus in each of our classrooms. And that obviously that it's not just the academic, but social and emotional learning is really important. And I'll talk more about that in goal three. Goal two is the equitable support for all learners. Um, I think one of the things that I am most proud of is that we kept a lens on our ELD students and distance learning. As a team, you know, and working with Kathleen as we built what does a distance learning schedule look like, we prioritized a designated ELD. So every grade level offered a time for designated ELD. Getting them to attend was a, a more of a challenge in the beginning, but once we had students on site um, for, our dis, for our learning center, um, those attendance rates become, became much better. We were also able to offer intervention to a limited number of students. Our kindergarten team had a set time each day where intervention was offered. And then we had um, through power school, they were able to provide some support for those students that stayed longer. And then we had teachers that took on intervention sort of on their own through office hours and extended time online. Um, we use a lot of progress monitoring. And I know my colleagues will laugh because it's the spreadsheet. You know, I think we all hated spreadsheets by the end of it, but they became invaluable in tracking not only attendance, but engagement and many of the assessment that we were using through, we were using iStation. So how were kids doing on their minutes and what skills were they developing um, in that using that program? Um, I think engagement was challenging for all of us. So we're still re regrouping on that. Um, and like others had said, getting hands-on instructional materials and supplies was critical. Lot, many of the families that we serve at Rucker um, simply either because of distance, you know, the limitations of shopping early on in COVID or just having access to financial resources. So providing them access to art supplies and paper and pencils and notebooks and just the, and the curricular materials was a really um, big deal for us at Rucker. As we're looking to move forward, that reintegration of SEAL and GLAD strategies into all classrooms is important. Those strategies are critical for the development of really strong oral language in not just our English learners, but all of our students. And we've spent a lot of time and dollars um, on SEAL training, and we want to make sure that that was a priority as we re-engage in our school year. Um, supporting effective ELD is also really important, especially as we looked at our baseline data, as I mentioned that you know, the majority of our students below level are English learners. So really helping teachers understand um, how to create strong designated ELD lessons and how to integrate those skills into their daily instruction is important. Um, the other thing that's the priority for me is this year is also to really support the differentiated needs of our students that have disabilities. Um, we know that just them being separated from school, oftentimes separated from having that consistent access to services, not because they weren't available, but because of, you know, maybe technology access or family challenges, that we really wanted to take a little a closer look um, at what differentiation and providing those supports in the classroom for those students. Um, this year, we're gonna offer literacy workshops to families. They'll be outside of school, following all of the safety guidelines. Um, and we're gonna work, um, purchase the products through Lectura Books. It's the Latino Family Literacy Project. Um, it provides um, targeted literacy training to families. Um, I'm working closely with my ELAC group. I have some parents who are interested in being trained and I have some staff interested in supporting that. Um, so literacy skills for families, 
and they have a like a checkout little library so families could take home side by side readers that are both in English and Spanish so that they can help develop those literacy foundations at home. Um, diagnostic assessments. We're probably going to be talking a lot about assessments over the school year. Um, you know, the, the STAR is sort of a nice um, assessment that we talk about. You probably see it in our, our past board presentations, but really drilling down to see what those specific skills kids need. Um, a lot of phonemic awareness, a lot of phonological work that needs to happen. Um, we've already started um, doing uh, FMP with both all of two, three, four, and five this year to be more diagnostic. So that's a focus for us. And then ongoing, the PLC work to analyze data and then identify areas of need and continue to monitor progress. So if we're not looking at the data and we're not creating an action plan, then it doesn't have any value in collecting the data. Goal three, the school culture engagement. This is sort of my, where, where I love to live. Um, the academics are really important, but if we don't have a strong school community that is welcoming, um, uh, students aren't going to thrive in our school environment. During distance learning, we did extensive outreach to families to engage and re-engage students. So like everyone else, multiple absences. Um, for us, tracking down families often meant driving down dirt roads onto ranches um, and trying to find where kids were. Um, but we had an amazing team of people that just really stayed on that. Um, we were able to continue many of our school traditions and our PBS culture continued in the virtual environment. We had, you know, the virtual turkey trot. We had virtual breakfast with Santa. We kept up with our monthly PBS assemblies and our awards. We just changed our matrix to fit the distance learning requirements. So it was really fun. Those were kind of the fun moments. It was amazing to see that we could, you know, actually have like 200 people on a Zoom session and it didn't get too crazy. Um, we had a lot of virtual student enrichment. Um, we had lunch bunch, so teachers sponsored opening up a Zoom so kids could see their friends. They were really missing that. We had parents that would did some cooking lessons and different, um, we call them virtual field trips in the classroom for um, students. So it was, it was a good way to stay connected. And then my ELAC and Home and School Club continued to meet virtually every month. And so that was really important. Um, ELACs, if they had a difficulty meeting virtually, there was a group of moms that would kind of meet in the parking lot and they would share a phone or a device and so that they were still connected to the school in that way. I think for all of us, this re-engagement of our families through outreach is really important, um, especially at Rucker. We had the unique situation, right? ADB closed at the end of 2020, and they really never had the opportunity to be on campus and feel that strong connection to a school community. Um, and, and I know for many of our families that they've shared, like obviously the school closure was really difficult on them and their children. And so for us, it's we're kind of doing the reboot of welcoming ADB families once again, um, so that those kids feel like they have a strong connection to a school community. Um, so we're already starting, I have a brand new Home and School Club board, um, and I have a strong ELAC group still. So we've already started to meet and plan those activities um, and school events that we can do safely. PBIS is really ingrained at Rucker, and so we're gonna continue to strengthen that. We're focusing um, and integrating our social emotional second step curriculum. And to those, we start our day every day together. So our kids are lined up out on the yard. Uh, we have a sort of a morning greeting. We'd say the pledge, we say the Rucker Way together. And then we work on one of our second step skills. Um, either students are providing, you know, eventually they'll provide a skit or their message to the school community. So it's been a really nice way to, to re-engage us with each other. Um, we've started our student council. We are working on some enrichment opportunities, um, but really importantly, uh, we're seeing the need to fully utilize our PEI and our SLS services to support emotional well-being of students. Um, kids have experienced a lot of trauma and some of it is heartbreaking. Um, and we're very thankful that we have access to these mental health resources on our campus. And we just know that that's a critical need um, for them. Um, and even their family members, 
for my school staff, we are working on a book that the elementary principals worked through last year called Onward. So it's about social emotional resiliency. So I'm doing that monthly um, in my monthly staff meetings with uh, my staff. We're working on different aspects of helping us maintain our own social emotional re resiliency so that we have a strong start to the year. And then if you haven't been on our campus, you should come because we have some beautiful murals. Thank you, Mr. Mesa and team for helping us get those approved. But this is just a little slice of our latest mural. So thank you for listening this evening. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Board members, um, could you unshare your screen? Yes. Please. And that's selfish, that way I can see everybody. Board members, any questions or comments to Principal Willis Southland? Okay, Sorry. Trustee Nelson. Um, I looked up the Latino Family Literacy Project um, because I had never heard of Lectura books. Uh -huh. And I was really impressed. Have you shared that with the other elementary principals? Uh, no, not formally. I haven't shared that. I mean, it's Kathleen um, and I have talked about it and I've talked about it with some of my other colleagues. We've, we've used them. We've used them before with our migrant families. We've used them with um, our ELAX. Um, so we have had opportunities to work with that, this organization before. I mean, you're, you're uh, filling two birds with one stone, but I hate to say that. But anyway, um, <laughs> You're not about killing birds. Linda, you know what I'm talking about. So, yeah. I do know. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, the birds save the birds. But um, you're hitting the literacy and you're hitting the parent involvement. You're hitting both things at the same time. And both of those things are things that we need to focus on. So, I think it, it'd be a great thing. It's 2150 for one of the, uh, the, the different levels for the, for the elementary for a semester, I think it was. So yeah. it's not that expensive. It only had 180 books. One of the other programs had 160 books for lending, but you could spread it out. I just think it's a great idea. So thanks. Yeah, yeah we're gonna we'll try and run like the that semester twice. Just to the first time we need to figure out the logistics, and then the second round hopefully we'll get more parent involvement. Okay. Any other questions or comments, trustees? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you, Principal Will Southland and Ms. Berman. Yes, yeah, so our last but not least presenter is Christine Vasquez and she will talk to us about Glenview Elementary. Good evening, board members, Dr. Flores, cabinet members, and of course my awesome team. Let me share my screen. Is it being shared? Okay. Okay. So I wanted to start by um, acknowledging how um, this team that I am very lucky to work with, the six ladies that I think are the most amazing ladies in Gilroy, um, I, I want to dedicate, you know, my presentation and all the love that's going to be inside of it to um, them. I could not have done this year without them. So I'm just very thankful. And I think everybody should know how strong this elementary team is. <laughs> okay. Okay. So my first is a giant size picture of me, yes, um, but it's the first day of school. It is our welcome back. Um, we, we returned loud and proud and it was very exciting um, to see all those students' faces on campus and I just wanted to um, display my school and my really awesome sign. <laughs> So I do have a mission statement. However, I believe this quote is um, kind of how um, I drive my leadership. And, and it's basically about how I don't necessarily go by being in charge, but I take care of who I am in charge of. And, uh, you know, I know one of my colleagues often says how emotional I am. I could take that as a criticism or I could take that as a compliment because I, I believe it's a compliment because I think that y'all, y'all hear in my presentation how, um, how true, how truly in love I am with my school and the population I serve. 
So, uh, can, you know, we're all different, and I uh, presented mine in three different uh, columns, one of the successes, uh, the challenges, and then how I'm going to be addressing. So, um, you know, one of the successes was, of course, the scope and sequence. Um, this, this team kind of helped keep us focused and um, everything in line. Um, I was lucky enough to have somebody in kinder first all the way to fifth grade representing Glenview. So they were able to come back and bring back our team's collaboration together. Um, of course, another success is the high use of uh, technology applications. Of course, you know, in the prior to the pandemic, we had many teachers, many veteran teachers who um, were opposed to using applications and this kind of just, you know, they had no choice and they actually, you know, I'm really impressed at how they just took off. Um, another success was, uh, you know, doing science lessons, obviously those are a lot of hands-on activities. And I was really impressed that my teachers were still continuing to do those science lessons. Um, they would just make sure, they would sit in parking lots if they had to, to meet their students, to get them their materials. We'd had distributions and these teachers continually did engineering practices over online. And, you know, I, I, I never expected that. And it was just really exciting to see those kids continue to do those. Um, challenges. So, of course, just like my uh, colleagues, the engagement of our students, you know, is really hard because many of our students kept their cameras off and they had distractions in their homes. And so the engagement was a big challenge for uh, my teachers. I, I had to sub often and I was often very discouraged um, at how many students kept their cameras off. I understand that it had a lot to do with the technology issues and so forth, um, but I it, I don't know how my teachers continued to teach, not knowing if that student was there or not. So um, that was a challenge. Of course, just like everybody, we had technology issues, internet connection issues, you know, Zoom issues at times. Um, we did obviously address that when we opened, we were the second um, elementary um, access center to open. Um, another challenge was that some of our students weren't getting their materials. For distributions, they, we just had families who were just not engaged. And so some students just didn't have their materials and it was a struggle. So moving forward in uh, LCAP goal number one, um, my action plan is I'm definitely gonna recenter instruction in small, um, small group uh, reading. Um, prior to the pandemic, uh, we were like, on the runway, ready to take off. Uh, Kathleen and um, some of the coaches, we really uh, worked hard to create this plan and then we shut down. So it was very discouraging for me. However, uh, we know what to do, we know how to do it. Um, and that's where we're going. We're going in that direction. Um, another action plan for us is that we're gonna have intentional opportunities for collaboration um, with specific data uh, to drive our instruction. Um, I think one of our weaknesses in the past was there wasn't a lot of collaboration at Glenview um, prior to me getting here uh, five years ago. And in my recent walkthrough, uh, I'm tickled to say that it was very, very noted that my teachers are doing a lot more collaboration. Um, obviously, a, a huge action plan is that we want academic growth for all of our students in all areas. So this um, is something important that I think that you will help you understand what Glenview is and what we're working with and the challenges that we face. Um, it's actually a huge snapshot of what's driving my SIPSA plan. And again, giving you an idea of what I'm working with. So last year, uh, data that was done in uh, March, you can see that we had in the first column, uh, 70, so we, we had a total of 477 students, uh, 20 to 50% of them, I'm sorry, 70 students had 20 to 50% absences, and 19 of those students had over 50% absences, 87 of those students had 20 or more missed class sessions, a total of, uh, let's see, 176 of my students had multiple absences or multiple missed classes. So, that gives us a total of 36.9% of our students who are missing our session. So not only prior to the pandemic, um, we 
we had a very challenging population as far as academics are concerned and other needs. This pandemic also gave us a huge hit. However, I'm positive that we're gonna go in the right direction. And uh, like I said, we were on that runway taking off and uh, I, I'm, I'm positive we're gonna take off flying. So this uh, slide um, kind of leads me into goal number two. So again, um, a, a big success during our uh, distance learning was that small group instruction had continued. Um, we also were very diligent about pro providing or giving an opportunity for students to come and pick up all their materials they needed. We gave them the pencil, the uh, whiteboard, the, everything that you can possibly, the scissors, everything they would possibly need, because again, we serve a population of need and we want to make sure that there was 100% um, access to all the materials they needed to be successful in any classroom at home. Um, my literacy facilitator, she uh, held small group instruction intervention, and she also continued to hold her newcomers group. We do have a huge population coming to us that are newcomers to the country, and she was able to continue that. A challenge um, for us was, again, attendance and engagement, um, but especially during ELD, which was one of the pieces that we needed uh, to be hit hard, um, but because ELD was scheduled uh, after lunch, it was really hard for us to re-engage our students after lunch. They'd do their morning sessions and they wouldn't return. Um, again, you know, although it's a, a success, it, could, it was a challenge as well. Uh, material distribution, we couldn't get our, our parents to engage in getting here to pick up their materials. So there would be times where students wouldn't have their materials. We would have to go out by car and deliver them to their porches. Um, and that was a challenge for us. Um, and again, uh, reaching all of our students with the internet. And that is why we were the second school to um, open the um, access center. Moving forward, um, we are enlisting all of our staff to support with intervention. So um, whatever staff is having their downtime, we are using them and utilizing them to do any kind of um, re-engagement to our learning loss. Um, for example, uh, in our nursing, uh, our nurse um, office, we have students who are diabetic. And so when they're getting taken out to uh, uh, check sugars, get their insulin. We have the nurse flashing flashcards at them, you know, because we know that there is a loss in their learning and we're just trying anything we can. We're, we're trying to learn anytime. So um, another action plan for us is the implementation of our specific reading strategies, including the letters training. I like uh, Jean, I do have over half of my staff uh, in the uh, enrolled in letters. Um, the other big thing for us is that we uh, started thinking maps for ELLs or path to proficiencies. I have two teachers who are a uh, trainer of trainers and they started that during distance learning, of course, just like the students, it was hard to engage the teachers in that training. So we kind of put it on hold until we return this year. And so that will help reinforce our GLAD and SEAL. So we're just putting another layer onto something that we've already got. So I'll have goal number three. Um, again, just like Jean, this is my happy place. I do believe that this is probably where I shine the most um, because I believe that my job is to bring joy to the school and the teachers obviously to bring joy to their classroom. So um, I often get asked, how come I'm so good to my teachers? I spoil them, but I truly believe that if I'm good to my teachers, they're gonna be good to my babies. And that's what's the priority for me. So again, a success was having that materials pick up every month. Um, we continued to have PBIS assemblies and incentives. Um, we had our staff uh, supporting just like uh, Marisa and everybody else has um, expressed. We had like a IT center in the front office where we would have, you know, yard duties. Everybody who was here on staff outside helping with the um, connections to the computers. Um, you know, they would come straight, they were supposed to be in class. We'd get them in class right here until the session ended. Um, the outreach was like impeccable. 
I can't even tell you how amazing my staff did at outreaching, you know, Kathleen or somebody would say, we need to get these kids, you know, for something, lunch, lunch applications, and there they go, and we were done. So I was very fortunate, and I will always, always, always brag about how amazing my staff is and how lucky I am to have them. Challenges, of course, was the attendance, as you saw in the slide that I shared with you. Um, reaching and connecting with families. You know, I serve a population of, uh, you know, families who I don't know necessarily had the best experiences uh, in school. So they're kind of like standoffish to education. You know, the principal gave them a bad taste in their mouth in the past. Teachers might have. And so my job was to, you know, make them feel safe and that they could trust me. So during this pandemic, you know, I'm thankful that I wasn't a brand new principal because they already knew when I, I was very sincere when I would reach out, whatever you need, tell me what you need and I would take care of them. But it was still very challenging for some of us to get to some of those families who just completely fell off the grid. Um, there was a huge disconnection between school and home because it just, I think because these students were inside their homes going to school, some of our parents didn't take it as serious as we needed them to. But again, moving forward, we're um, gonna erase those challenges and start with an action plan that we've got going forward with uh, LCAP Goal 3. Um, I have a dynamic PBIS team who is working right now currently on, on making a hybrid of our curriculum that we're using second step with our PBIS system. So it goes really well and flows nicely. Um, I do, and one, I'm one of the lucky recipients of the NSU grant, like um, Elliot, uh, where this grant allows me to re-engage our families um, with school community. So just like we talked about earlier, we had a workshops. I'm gonna use this money to fund workshops on my campus, as well as um, it helps me fund the PBIS incentives, as well as paying my PBIS team to meet and help plan um, after school. Um, a huge, huge, huge uh, piece of my action plan in my SIPSA is the re-engagement of our students, not only academically, but behaviorally um, with assemblies and a lot of positive behavior incentives. So, uh, you know, I can't necessarily do, I do assemblies, but I try to hold them over Zoom so that um, I can get more students in um, one, one shot because you know I don't have that much time in a day. But you will, if you can get to one of my assemblies, you will just die of how silly and embarrassing I am. <laughs> but it's all for the kids. So I wanted to share some pictures of, um, for example, my assemblies would be drive-bys. Um, you know, I sat out in the front, rain or shine, uh, giving those awards, putting my cape on, again, acting really silly because my job is to bring joy to my families. Um, I would, you know, send prizes to these kids' homes so that they can get rewarded at home. We had spirit days. We had, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm 100 year, the 100th day of school where students would dress up like, cute little old folk. Uh, and so again, the spirit was still here on, on, on site through Zoom. Um, one of the big things that I tried really hard and I used that NSU grant was uh, materials distribution. It was not fun for a kid to come and pick up homework. So I always incentivized it or made it exciting. Um, for example, um, for Dr. Seuss's birthday, I had provided each kid with a little backpack and little goodies that had Dr. Seuss in them. Their awards were there when they came to pick them up. Um, during Christmas time, of course, I stayed away from Christmas, but I gave them a little box with like a little stuffed animal. Um, but I really tried hard to bring joy to um, everything everything that I had with my students. So I want to end with this picture that is actually of my very first year of being a principal, which was very challenging. And it don't ask me how or why, but I decided to continue um, or finish my education and I got my master's that year. Um, I believe that uh, the way that I lead my school is by being very human. And so my school is very much my family. So everything that I go through and everything that I do, I celebrate with my students. And so when I graduated, which was so hard, um, I played music 
and I walked to every single uh, recess um, with each class, and I just danced with them and celebrated that uh, that in life you're going to do, do challenging things, but nothing's impossible. And so um, I want to end with my another quote, which is great culture is not an accident. And I, I truly believe that um, it's, it, it, it happens when we depend on each other and we create supportive caring conditions um, for everyone. And I truly, truly, truly believe that during this pandemic, I have been able to do that, um, not only with my school, but with my um, colleagues as well. Um, and, you know, when we reopened the school, it was really exciting to see secondary out here helping and during graduation I was able to go out and and be a part of that I really strongly um, hope that we go in the direction of more of unification and we are mixing and mingling together and we're not secondary elementary um, and so I really strongly believe that um, this pandemic although ripped many parts of the education apart has brought a lot of pieces together. And so that is my presentation. And thank you for uh, watching and listening all about Glenview. Thank you. And there we go. Any comments or questions from trustees? I don't want to take up anybody's time, but if uh, nobody's going to ask something, I. I'm truly humbled by all the challenges you guys have all met, but even more ecstatic by seeing you and uh, describing how you conquered them. Uh, here's a question that's uh, that's more of a rhetorical one, not to be answered now, but in seeing the mission statements, I did notice that they're all different, unique, they're all fantastic. I'm wondering if we've ever thought of having a unified mission statement, uh, particularly by by grade level, by you know K K five and then middle school and then high school. I, I know we. Otherwise, we have 17 of them, including uh, the district wide, and that could be its own as well. But it's kind of more rhetorical, more of a takeaway. Um, uh, Christine, I see Ms. Vasquez, I see your, your energy in the weekly newsletters. Uh, I get to enjoy them every week, so I really enjoy them. And Elliot, obviously, you had the Dr. Seuss uh, virtual reading day, which was really good. I was able to participate in that. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, Rod Kelly, I got to see the lunches as they were starting to be distributed at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and so I make an effort to kind of drive around and visit schools on my way to, uh, on the outside, uh, as I go to Lowe's or run errands or stuff like that. Uh, so I saw the distribution of lunches being handled very, very orderly and, and people kind of getting a sense of normalcy in there as well. So I got to see that. And Rucker was actually the first school that I got to visit as a um, as uh, as the first school that I stepped on 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 the premises after the pandemic started, and I did get to see the six foot signs on the floor that were being painted, the QR codes as they were being used and deployed. So that was really good to see those uh, those modifications to what our current pandemic is forcing us to do as well. Um, so so thank you again. I just wanted to mention something from each of your schools. Thank you, Trustee Diaz. So one of the things I want to um, say is one of the biggest traits of all um, educators, it's mandatory that we all have the trait for monitoring and adjusting. And you have shown that in spades, the entire district has. Um, I one of the things I hear is engaging families and you tracked them down to give them uh, the whatever they needed, whether it was materials or finding out about their kids. And so you engage with them and I hope that those relationships continue because I suspect as an EDNI organization, there were families that you had not interacted with before or much. And so I hope that those um, relationships continue. Also technology and teaching, we all learned a lot. And uh, I suspect that uh, teaching will never be the same. You will never do your job the same way that you did pre-COVID. And that's both good and bad. And that's for all of us. Um, but more importantly, I want to thank you 
for being incredible role models for resiliency, determination, um, being goal oriented, and for caring and supporting your staffs and your families and your students. Because um, I know that this, what I hear is um, being out of school for a year and a half has now presented new challenges and you were ready to really move forward. And then you took 17 steps back. And so that can be demoralizing, but your energy is contagious. And um, Dr. Flores, I say that for your staff as, as well as the, the four principals tonight and all the teachers that this encompasses because it has been an incredible year. We've learned a lot. And um, I think we will never do our jobs the same. And that's both good and bad. So thank you for your tenacity and your determination and your commitment to your kids. That's great. I just want to say thank you too. I, you are, I've said this to the principals directly, but they've done an amazing job. Uh, when we think about where we've been since March 13th, 2020 till now, it's, it's an amazing journey. And our, our principals have done an incredible job. And this group is so co cohesive, the elementary principals. I, I bet they talk to each other in one way or another every day. Mm -hmm. they, they really are a collaborative group and that's, that's been great because a lot of the procedures, protocols, they did together. Anytime we talk about anything new, they want to do it as a group, which has been great. So I, and I know it's been really hard on elementary principals because they don't have an assistant principal. They've had to do a lot of this themselves and we really appreciate it. They're the most resilient group of people I think I know. So thank you so much. You did a good job in your presentations. We learned a lot tonight, so we appreciate it. Good job. Thank you. Good job, baby. And that ends this special session, mm -hmm. study session. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. See you, you tomorrow.